Hey everyone, today I'm going to be showing you why lightning doesn't always take the shortest path. Lightning bolts are known for their jagged shape. They rarely take a straight line down to the earth. But why is that and how does lightning decide in the first place which direction to go? In order to show you which path lightning prefers to take, we need some really high voltages first. This Tesla coil that I have can easily throw out 5 inch sparks. Watch this. Look at that. What's really cool is I can even play music on it as well. If you interrupt it at just the right time, you can get it to play different tones. First, let me prove to you that these sparks don't take the shortest path. So let me stick my hand here and let it shock me. So you'll notice each time it's striking my finger, it's not taking a straight path across. What it's doing is it's actually taking the path where it's easiest to ionize. For example, it turns out on the surface of insulators, it's actually easier to ionize air or create sparks than away from it. I have here a glass rod. A glass rod is not a good conductor. Glass is a good insulator. But watch what happens when I hold the glass rod near the Tesla coil. So for example, here's how far away I can get while still getting shocked without the glass rod. And here's what it looks like when I have the glass rod in my hand. I can actually get the spark gap to occur further away when I'm holding the glass rod than when I'm not holding it. So I actually get shocked from a longer distance away. So sparks will tend to follow the surface of an insulator rather than be away from it, even if it means taking a longer path. So let me show you with this glass plate here. So I have a copper conductor on the end of the plate. If I'm holding the copper conductor, you'll notice that the shortest path to get to the copper conductor is around this direction here. It's definitely not to go up to the glass and then over to the conductor. But watch what happens when I do this. You'll notice that the preferred path that it takes is up along the surface of the glass. There are three mechanisms for why this occurs. The first one is because of polarization, and the other reason is because surface conductivity. On the surface of insulators, there can actually be electron holes that will make it easier for a current to pass through it than on the bulk of the material. And then also on the insulator itself, there can actually be a buildup of electric charge and that actually helps the spark gap form better than if it were just in the air itself. So you can see that sparks don't take the shortest path, but they just take the path in which they can ionize the easiest, even if it means taking a longer physical path. Remember that nature is frugal. It likes to do things that take the least amount of energy. This is the same thing that's happening in lightning strikes as well. The lightning is taking the path in which it was easiest to ionize. Now this ease of ionization depends on a lot of things. You saw it depended on whether I was around glass or not. It also depends on how much water is in the air. It can even depend on how much dust or particles there are in the air. So depending on your atmospheric conditions currently, there'll be parts of the air that have higher humidity or lower humidity and parts that have more dust or less dust. And all of that is going to determine the path that the lightning takes to the ground. Usually in the center of a storm cloud is a large negative charge with positive charges on the top surrounded kind of by a skin of a positive charge. If those negative charges get to be too much in the cloud, then they start to branch out and break through the skin of that positive layer. Now these branches don't just come out in a straight line, but what they do is they start to find regions of the air that can be ionized the easiest, so with the lowest dielectric breakdown. And so there are portions of the air that get ionized in these jagged patterns. And again, these jagged patterns don't take the path of least resistance or a straight line. They just ionize the air around them that's easiest to be ionized. So before a lightning strike even occurs, these steppers come down in this branch-like pattern, just looking for air to ionize and create an electrical path. So as the stepper leaders move further down, as they get close to the ground, now the ground is positively charged below it because there's a bunch of negative charges above it. And so it's inducing these positive charge to build up towards the ground. What will happen is those positive charges will eventually start to branch up themselves. And once the stepper leader meets one of those positive branches coming up, that's when the main bolt of lightning can occur because now it has a conductive ion path all the way to the ground. 
And the interesting thing about lightning strikes is when they're sending out these stepped leaders, they don't actually know what's occurring on the ground below them. They just look in the vicinity of around 50 to 60 meters around them. And whatever path is the easiest to ionize in that 50 to 60 meters, that's where it's going to ionize and create the step leader path. So one rule of thumb to tell if you're gonna be the thing that's struck by lightning as opposed to a tall tree or something next to you, is imagine a 60 meter sphere. For example, I have here a tree and a person in a plain open field in the middle of a thunderstorm. We wanna know who's going to get struck by lightning. This is going to represent my 60 meter sphere. Now it's not a sphere because I'm in flat land, it's just a disc. So the stepper leader of the lightning is going to be in the center here because it only looks around 50 to 60 meters away from it. In the first case scenario, let's say that you're far away from the tree. Let's see what happens. So the stepper leader is going to occur in the center and then look around 60 meters away from it for the easiest path of ionization. So if the stepper leader is right here, the tree is going to be the closest. But if it's over here, either the tree or the ground is going to be the closest. But if it's over here, then the person walking is going to be the closest. So what that means is that when you're pretty far away from the tree, you or the tree have an equal chance of getting hit. But let's say you're a lot closer to a tree. Well, that means that there's no way in which this sphere can touch you. You can see that this is the closest it can get, and in this case, it's either gonna strike the tree or the ground, but it can't get to you. Now, this safe area around something tall is called a shadow radius, and you can actually calculate the shadow radius based on how tall the object is using this formula. So if you're here, the tree's gonna get struck by lightning. If you're here, the tree's gonna get struck by lightning. If you're here, now there's an equal chance that you or the tree is gonna get struck by lightning. But don't take this as a suggestion that you should go under tall trees during a lightning storm. That's because even though you're not gonna be the one that's going to get directly struck by lightning in this case, you're still probably going to get hurt and even die if the tree gets struck by lightning. Because as the lightning comes down and strikes the tree, what happens is there's a lot of charge on the tree and that charge needs to go somewhere. So it's gonna go into the ground around it and it's also going to go up into you as well. So that means that in order to get killed or hurt by lightning, you don't have to be the thing that got struck, but you just have to be near the thing that got struck. So it's kind of a catch 22. During a thunderstorm, you don't wanna be the tallest thing around. But if you're away from a lot of things, then you're the tallest thing around. And if you're close to something taller, you're not the tallest thing around anymore, but you're still going to get hurt because that thing is now going to attract the lightning. Hey everyone, thanks for watching another episode of the Action Lab. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't forget to subscribe if you haven't subscribed yet. And you can also hit the bell so that you can be notified when I release my latest video. And check out theactionlab.com to see the Action Lab experiment boxes and my experiment book as well. And thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.